German illustrator and graphic artist Andreas Paul Weber was born in 1893 in the rural town of Arnstadt. At the age of 12 he suffered a serious eye injury which affected his vision throughout his life, but luckily not enough to prevent him pursuing his career. In 1908 when he was 15 he joined a back to nature youth movement known as the Jung van der Vogel which promoted a healthy energetic lifestyle hiking around the German countryside. A couple of years later, he enrolled into the Erfurt School of Applied Arts. He didn't complete the course, but it was there that he began to develop his visual creativity and to learn about methods of printing. But war broke out in 1914 and his life changed dramatically when he served as an engineer in the German army on the Eastern Front. Even during the conflict, he was producing some illustrations for an army newspaper. And when the war ended, he started working as a freelance illustrator, creating woodcuts and engravings, primarily for books, although he had some success designing ex libris book plates. In 1918, he created the dramatic title page and poster for Arthur Dinter's anti-Semitic book, Sin Against the Blood. And in 1919, he published a comically illustrated edition of The Magic Violin, an opera originally performed by puppets, written by Franz Graf von Pocci. And in the following year, he published two illustrated collections of verse titled The Carnival Games, written by the medieval poet Hans Sachs, featuring similarly brutalist but comically expressive illustrations. In 1921, he produced an even more popular edition of the German folk tale Till Eulenspiegel, using the same method, but with the addition of a somewhat redundant overprinted second colour. And between 1921 and 22, Weber collaborated with another former van der Vogel member, Hjalmar Kutzlep, on two books lamenting the growth of technology. The first was The Land Driver, and this was followed by The Contemporary, featuring some uncharacteristically loose pen drawings which had a more than passing resemblance to the work of Heinrich Clay. In 1924, Weber produced similarly energetic pen and ink drawings for Goethe's epic poem, Reynard the Fox. And again, he utilised the gestural potential of the medium with significant success in his series of engrossing narrative images. In 1925, Weber established his own publishing and printing company, the Clan Press. But although I did find a fairly long list of books published at this time, the only one I found any evidence of was his cover for a book of German ballads. Weber's politics were considerably left of centre, and between 1930 and 1936, he also worked with the writer Ernst Niekisch at the Bolshevik magazine Resistance. It was in the pages of this magazine that, despite his own anti-Semitic opinions, he visually expressed his vehement opposition to the rise of Adolf Hitler's National Socialists, with a series of dark comic images which mocked the Fuhrer and his aspirations, and warned of the disasters which could lie ahead. In the 1932 pamphlet, Hitler a German Disaster, Niekisch attacked the man and his beliefs directly, and Weber illustrated it with six pen drawings. But mockery of the Nazis wasn't his sole occupation in the 1930s, and in addition to broader satirical drawings and lithographs such as 1934's The Informer, which graphically encapsulated the paranoia of the period, he also found time to paint and had some success with his portraits. But Niekisch's continued dissent and Weber's graphic support led in 1937 to Niekisch being sentenced to life imprisonment although he was actually released following Germany's defeat, and Weber was incarcerated for six months in a concentration camp. While there, he was at least allowed to draw non-political images, and he used his time to create drawings for what would later become a memorable series of subtle visual metaphors published as the chess players. Despite his enduring distaste for the Nazi party, when the Second World War began in 1939, and quite probably chastened by his time in the concentration camp, he turned his attention towards the sins of the British Empire, with a series of 45 relentlessly scathing lithographic indictments, which took him a total of two years to complete. This body of vitriolic dark images collected under the title The British Pictures was arguably his greatest achievement. 
And although they were not created by Weber for the purpose, Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, reprinted them in German newspapers and magazines to vilify the enemy in the eyes of the German people. And it has to be admitted that these images repeatedly struck at many of the less savoury aspects of Britain's fading global aspirations. But he also continued to target the more generic ills of life in the 20th century, and among other work he produced during the war, in 1943 Weber created a dystopian image titled The Rumour, undoubtedly one of his finest and most disturbing images. In 1944, when it became obvious to everyone but Hitler and his most fervent supporters that Germany was going to lose the war, Weber was actually conscripted into the army despite being 51 years old at the time. After the end of the war he carried on creating his bleakly comical lithographs and fired satirical rounds at pretty much every aspect of authority, from the church to politics and medicine. And he produced many limited edition prints, which despite, or maybe because of their unsettling subject matter, sold well among collectors. But at the same time he also revealed a less vitriolic side to his nature, with some lighter subjects, including his illustrations for Eagle und Ingelen, a whimsical series about the lives of a group of endearing hedgehogs. Throughout the 1950s, many of these more whimsical illustrations were very popular as illustrated calendars. And there are quite a few other more child-friendly images produced around this time, but for the life of me I haven't been able to identify most of them with a particular publication. And there's room for even greater confusion, as like many satirists, he also used anthropomorphic images to make serious political and social points. Between 1954 and 1967, Weber also contributed political illustrations to a revived version of the satirical magazine Simplicissimus. And from 1959 until his death, he published an illustrated yearbook titled The Critical Calendar which was a collection of satirical illustrations which accompanied text reprinted from literature and the press. These editions were a clear demonstration that both his graphic skills and his keen if jaundiced imagination had not been diminished by age. There is other work created in his later career for which I found examples, including some lithographs for Don Quixote, and a frustratingly small number for the tales of Baron Munchausen, but I can find no record of when they were published or in what format. In this period he revised earlier projects and either recreated them as lithographs or added colour to previously published monochromes, such as his chess player's drawings and his illustrations for the work of Francois Villon, which he had first produced in 1939. And in 1974, he published a book collection of satirical anthropomorphic visual metaphors as the Animal Picture Book. All these projects kept Weber creatively active well into old age, and after a life devoted to both art and illustration, he died in 1980 at the age of 87. As befits the visual legacy created by Weber, it makes a pleasant change to note that there is a museum dedicated to him and his work in the German town of Ratzeburg, and a website which can be translated from the German if you want more detail about his life. My hope is that this video might bring his remarkable body of work to a wider international audience.